Many would like to extend their authority, have more influence, longer. Politicians want to stay in office longer. This rich young ruler came to Jesus Christ and he was looking for age-abiding life. He wanted to stay around longer, enjoy what he had longer. And the question he asks is, what good thing shall I do? He was looking for a method, not a Messiah. He would make a good religious person, for religious expressions are based on what can I do. And so he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Now, Jesus responds to this young man in a way which is not common with most evangelical evangelistic approaches today. In most evangelistic circles today, the answer to the man would be, wow, you want to be a Christian? You want, to, you want eternal life? Well, here's what you need to do. Come forward, raise your hand. Make a public declaration. Accept and receive. But Jesus takes the man back to the very essence of what salvation is all about. The first thing he does is point to the holiness of God. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. The second thing he does is points him to the law. Christianity is based on some very simple principles. First of all, salvation is based on the gift of God. For salvation, there needs to be the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those are the two promises offered in the Bible to those who would believe on Jesus Christ. For forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, there needs to be repentance and faith. For repentance and faith, there needs to be conviction of sin. For conviction of sin, there needs to be knowledge of sin. For the knowledge of sin, there needs to be the fear of God, and for the fear of God, there needs to be the knowledge of God. And so, what Jesus is doing with this man is taking him all the way back to that first acknowledgement that is absolutely essential and necessary for a person to come into a right relationship with God. He must first acknowledge that God is holy and man is sinful. So Jesus first speaks of God being holy, and then he points to the law. Notice in verse 18, the response of this young man. Jesus says, you need to keep the commandments. And the response of the man is, which ones? Isn't that a, such a predictable response? It's like having a child and, and, and you give them a command, you know, clean your room. And the question often can come back, how much of the room? Clean it all. You mean the all that you can see or under my bed also? <laughs> you see, the person who is trying to purchase his own salvation based on his own good works, he's interested in just how small that list can be. James tells us in chapter 2, verse 10 of his epistle that whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of it all. James makes it very clear that the purpose of the law is to convict man of sin. And so Jesus is first bringing this man to a confrontation of the holiness of God, the law of God, so that he can see his need for a Savior. Jesus answers his question, which ones, and says, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus selects what I call the low-hanging fruit of the Ten Commandments. 
When you speak to someone about the law of God or becoming a Christian or the need for a Savior, very often people will respond to you, well, what is God looking for? I've never murdered anybody. I've never murdered anybody. So these are the big ones. And so he starts with the ones that oftentimes are the obvious ones. People love to sort of bring out before you in defense of their own righteousness. I've never murdered anyone. I've never committed adultery. Well, in a sense, she left me first, but, and then it isn't adultery, then is it? I mean, you get that sort of sense where you begin to go down the list. You shall not steal. I've never stolen anything. I've never lied. Now you begin to go down the list in terms of these commandments from the law, and you begin to wonder, can anyone actually say they haven't lied? Can anyone actually say they haven't stolen? He then says, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He leaves out, really, the first four commandments dealing with man's relationship with God, and he only deals with five commandments, man's relationship with man. And he adds one at the end, of course. He adds that commandment which comes from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where you're to love your neighbor as yourself. Later, when Jesus is approached and asked which is the greatest commandment, Matthew 22 records him saying in verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is likened unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so he's laying out before the man a short resume of the commandments of God, testing this man to see if he will acknowledge his own need for a Savior. And the young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What a very high opinion of himself he had. So often, if you are attempting to share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ with someone who has not yet experienced the refreshing and regeneration work of the Holy Spirit, if they do not acknowledge nor are aware of their need for a Savior, it's kind of hard to sell them that idea. If they don't know that they are dead, if they don't know that they are blind, it's very difficult to give someone good news if they don't first already know some bad news. This man, obviously, the perception that he had in his life was that he was okay. He was all right. Yeah, is that it? The sense of the question that he asks after making this statement about his own righteousness, well, is that it? Don't murder anybody, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, love your neighbor as yourself, honor your father and mother. I've done that since I was a young kid. That's it, huh? What else do I lack? Within his question, we see that there is that nagging acknowledgement that resides within the heart of everyone who is attempting to approach God robed in their own righteousness. For there will always be that sense and fear that I may have missed something. Oftentimes when I speak to someone who begins to explain to me what they consider to be acceptable within a character that would be acceptable before God. I, I'll say to them, so do you think you're going to go to heaven then? Oh yes, I'm a good person. By whose definition? Well, most people would agree that I'm a, you know, I'm a good person, I've done good things. I've not tried to injure anyone. Isn't it interesting how often people will define sin as that which injures another human being rather than first and foremost understanding that that which the Bible defines as sin is that which injures our relationship with God. But they'll defend themselves, oh no, I'm fine, I'm okay. 
I've kept these things from my youth, but what things do I lack? There's that sense within a self-righteous person that, but what if he's one good deed, not enough? I ask people, they seem to have this idea that there's a scale in heaven. Then when you get to heaven, they're going to take your good deeds and your bad deeds and they're going to weigh the two. And I love to ask people that sort of have that mentality, I love to say to them, so how much does a good deed weigh? And how much does a bad deed weigh? Are you assuming the weight is the same? Are you assuming that you understand the criteria for what is good and bad in the eyes of this judge that you're going to meet? Your eternal destiny literally in the balances. Do you really understand the criteria of that test? You see, within the heart of all mankind, the idea of passing into eternity is something that is a frightful experience if you don't understand what it is you're going to be confronted with. And so within the heart of this rich young ruler, there was this sense of, I, I, I've done all of those nice self-righteous things, but is there something I'm lacking? Is there something I'm missing here? And Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Mark adds to this, as Jesus is telling this man to sell all that he has. Mark adds to it in chapter 19, verse 21, come take up the cross and follow me. Jesus is addressing the fact that this man is still relying on his own righteousness and his own wealth for his own well-being. As a result of that, he is not truly seeking a savior He's not seeking to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He just wants to extend the ownership of what he has currently. He's lacked making God the master passion of his life, the life giver to him. He is like so many who approach Christianity as though they are buying an insurance policy. You know where you speak to an insurance agent, you know that it's probably a prudent thing to do to have insurance on your home or your car. What you want is maximum protection for minimum input. And so that's what most people are looking for. We just want maximum protection with minimum input. Isn't it interesting that when you speak with non-Christians, those who haven't come into a right relationship with God, when they speak about death, if you've ever been to a funeral or associated with a non-Christian who's just gone through a, a death in the family or a friend, the words they use are sort of interesting to me. They'll say, yes, well, the person's gone on to a better place now. How many tombstones do you see where it says, rest in peace? Nobody says, gone to dust, being eaten by worms. They all have this perception that somehow after leaving this earthly abode, they're going to arrive in some sort of heavenly realm which is going to be better than the one they left. Rest in peace. God be with you. So many non-Christians will use those sorts of terms. But this man lacked. He lacked in the area of having God as chief passion. Now in verse 22 we read, When the young man had heard these things, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You wonder at this point what sort of a cost-benefit analysis this man did. He came to Jesus Christ who obviously was in the midst of doing some pretty spectacular things. The hand of God was certainly upon him. And he came asking, what good things must I do that I might inherit everlasting life? Jesus gave him the answer and the man went away sorrowful. 
So in his mind, the cost of giving up all that he had was too great. Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Uh, evangelical pastor, and they're all praying together, giving you the idea that uh, they're all praying to the same God. Not true. I wish we had time uh, to talk about the fact that Allah is not the God of the Bible, <clears throat> although Vatican II says that Allah is. Uh, first of all, the Quran says Allah is not a father and he has no son. Allah hates Jews. Uh, the God of the Bible 203 times calls himself the God of Israel. 12 times he calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Never once does he call himself the God of the Muslims or the God of the Arabs or the God of the British or the God of the French or Americans. Only the God of Israel. And we talked about that yesterday. Israel is, plays the key role and has the largest part of the Bible is, is about Israel and prophecies uh, concerning Israel. But I meet people all over the world. <clears throat> he said he was without sin. He said he would rise from the dead. He would come again. If he was merely a man, he's not a good man. He's either a liar or a lunatic. Uh, but a good man does not go around saying that sort of thing. And you cannot escape what Jesus said. We used to sing a, a hymn uh, when I was a boy in Sunday school. I don't know whether you sing that over here in England, but <clears throat> it went something like this. What will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. One day your soul will be asking, what will he do with me? You cannot escape the claims of Jesus. You cannot escape. The Bible is a historical, factual document, and we can prove that, <clears throat> and I think you've had a lot of proof uh, during these two days. You better have some proof for what you believe. Faith is a sincere, earnest conviction. <laughs> And you shouldn't have an earnest conviction about something that you are not 100% certain isn't true. Does that make sense? Uh, I remember saying something like that uh, in a very beautiful part of America, uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, snow-capped mountains all around in a small valley, and it's a little bit scary when the plane comes in there. And. Uh, I had about five or six people come after me after when I got off the platform. And they said, wait a minute, if you can prove it, where's faith? Well, I said, I think you must have a different idea of faith from the idea that I have, the idea, an idea that I got from the Bible. Faith is not a leap in the dark. You don't just decide to believe something. Oh, I was born a Buddhist and I'll die a Buddhist. I was born a Catholic, I'll die a Catholic. I was born, you know, in the Church of England, I'll die in the Church of England. I'm going to be loyal to... Wait a minute. Why? Tell me why. Some of the reasons that people give you for the church they go to, I wouldn't buy a refrigerator or a used car. Uh, well, I like the choir. Oh, the pastor is so kind. Well, it's really convenient. It's not far from where I live. My family has been in mem members of this church for, for generations. Really? That's not going to get you to heaven. You better investigate and find out whether it's true. Uh, you should not have confidence in something, especially uh, you're banking your eternal destiny on something that you are not 100% certain is not true. Uh, is true, I'm sorry. So we need to have proof. <laughs> and that's my topic today, proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, is this really biblical? Is proof biblical? Uh, doesn't the Bible just say have faith? Remember when Jesus uh, appeared to his disciples after his resurrection? They thought he was a spirit being. Remember what Jesus said? Well, take it by faith, guys. Just take it by faith. 
Is that what he said? He said, handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bones like you see me have. And you could go to Acts. Well, let's, let's go. I tend to just quote the Bible because it's much faster. But uh, it takes time to turn. But we could go to Acts chapter 1. Maybe we'll look at a few places in, in the book of Acts. And notice what it says. It's talking about after his resurrection, before he was taken up into heaven, he's with his disciples for 40 days. Verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, that is after his death, by many infallible proofs. It doesn't tell us all the details. You know that there were some who doubted. It says he appeared to 500 brethren at once. And some of them doubted, even after the resurrection of Christ. Some of his disciples still doubted. Remember we heard this morning about doubting Thomas. Except I put my finger into the print of the nails and I thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. Well, Jesus proved that he was the very one who hung on the cross, who was laid in the grave, who rose from the dead, and by many infallible proofs, he personally proved it to his disciples. Now you might say, well then how come? Why didn't he show himself to the Pharisees? Why, why didn't he come out and, and, and really prove it to everybody? He had already given the Pharisees so many proofs. And it says though, he had done so many miracles, yet they believed not on him. You remember, they knew that Lazarus had been raised from the dead. It was eyewitnesses of this event who came to the Pharisees and said, you better check, you, you got to do something to stop this guy. <clears throat> he just raised Lazarus from the dead and he's been in the grave four days. They knew it. <laughs> and what did that do to them? They're going to kill Lazarus too. They're going to kill Jesus. They were so stubborn and so determined in their hearts. So you can prove things. Now we're, we're talking about proof. And I want to give you some proofs. <clears throat> and I believe we need to give proofs to people. They need to have a solid foundation for their faith. But that doesn't mean that they're going to roll over and accept Jesus. There are some people who are absolutely stubborn. Reminds me of the, maybe you heard of the, <clears throat> uh, there's a little difference between American humor and British humor, and I don't know whether, uh, whether I communicate or not, but anyway, you've probably heard of the gentleman that thought he was dead. In fact, he was convinced he was dead, and nobody could convince him that he wasn't dead. And they took him to one psychiatrist after another. And they all tried, but they failed, and finally they took him to a psychiatrist and said, Listen, I can cure him of this. So what he did, the method he used for the weekly visits, he took this dead man, <laughs> the guy that thought he was dead, he took him to a morgue. And he would pull the sheet back and prick the finger of a corpse, squeeze it, and say, what, what, what are we learning about dead people? Well, dead people don't bleed. You convinced? Well, look, look. Yeah, dead people don't bleed. Next week, he did the same thing. Took him to another, another corpse and punctured the finger, squeezed it. Dead people don't bleed. And about five or six weeks in a row, finally he brought him into his office for the next visit, sat him down. He said, now what have we learned these last five weeks? Well, he said, we've learned for sure dead people don't bleed. Well, the psychiatrist grabbed his finger, punctured it, and squeezed it, and out comes some blood. What do you say to that? Well, look at that. I'll be. Dead people do bleed after all. <laughs> <clears throat> so, there, there are some people that, even when you lay the facts out before them, uh, they're not going to be convinced. They're not going to change their mind. <laughs> But we must give them the facts so they have no excuse, okay? And so that those who will believe will have a solid foundation. By many infallible proofs. Go to chapter 9. And notice, you get it all through the Bible. Uh, chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus has just become a believer. And uh, 
Verse 22, Acts 9, 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. He absolutely proved it beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah who had been promised and who had been crucified and risen from the dead. And what do they do? <clears throat> they went about, verse 24, they were, their lying in wait was known to Paul. Well, verse 23, the Jews took counsel to kill him. It was proved so thoroughly they could not deny it. And they have two choices. Either they're going to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, or they're going to kill this man who is proving to them that Jesus is the Messiah. And they decided they would kill his, his uh, witness. They would kill Paul. Well, proof then does not guarantee faith. It's a matter of the, of the heart. Uh, it's a matter of a, the willingness of the person to believe in Jesus Christ. And you've heard um, many proofs, uh, various proofs, that evolution is not true. We can prove that evolution is not true. It is ridiculous. It is absurd. It is a lie. It is a fraud. And I get angry. It is being taught as truth. It's fiction. It's being taught as fact. And these people will not change, no matter how much evidence you give them. Because if they do, then they are acknowledging that there is a God, a designer who created us, and we are accountable to him. And they are not going to stand for that for a moment. They're going to go into hell determined to, to have their own way and to stand firm in their rebellion against God. Jesus gave them plenty of proofs and they killed him. They crucified him. And you know that in doing that, they fulfilled the scriptures. The disciples doubted. And you remember what Jesus said to the two on the road to Emmaus. Uh, in Luke 24, you idiots. He used very harsh language. You fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then it says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You, you're downcast, you're discouraged, you've abandoned, I mean, your hope, your dream of the Messiah because they put him on a cross. If he wasn't on a cross, he's not the Messiah because your own prophet said he would be crucified. That is exactly what was foretold. He had to be crucified. Don't you know the prophets? You fools. You better pay attention to what the prophets have said. If you had paid attention, you would know that this is the Messiah himself. Well, I found out traveling around the world and talking with probably thousands of people, most people believe what they want to believe. Uh, you ever talk to a Mormon? <laughs> talk to Jehovah's Witnesses? I find that most people are in a cult because they want to be in the cult. Now, I've seen people delivered from cults, but it seems that they're few and far between. But still, we are going to continue to present the truth. Well, we've got to give proof. We've got to give our children, Sunday school kids, a solid foundation for their faith. We've got to train them so they can stand in the street toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Hindu, an atheist, and put them to flight confound them and prove from the scriptures that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. And I don't think we're doing that very well, <clears throat> in many instances at least, and this is why uh, so many of these people who thought they were believers once 
uh, have abandoned their faith that they thought they had. There may be some, even here at a conference like this, there may be some uh, who are just uh, stubborn, are going to continue to believe what they want to believe in the face of all the evidence to the contrary. Well, how did Paul go about this? And how should we go about proving that Jesus is the Messiah? We're in Acts chapter 9, so turn over to chapter 17 and notice what he did. Verse well, we'll read from verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, if you underline in your Bible, underline that. This is his modus operandus. You want to know how Paul preached the gospel? This is how he did it. Now my wife says, come on now, don't lay down rules. Uh, like this is the only way. Okay, but I think this is the biblical way, all right? <laughs> Uh, and uh, how did he do it? As his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. We've got to use the Bible, folks. <laughs> this is the sword of the Spirit. This is the evidence. Uh, here we have the absolute proof that Jesus is the Christ, that the Bible is God's Word. We've ta tried to talk. I, I think this has been a great conference. And I have told Ron, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think it's a rather unique conference. I think you've been overwhelmed with evidence uh, that should strengthen your faith and should help you uh, in seeking to win others to Christ. But he opened their own scriptures. He said, look what your own prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, and on and on it goes. Hosea, and Joel, and Amos, and Obadiah, Look what your own prophets said. They told you. They gave you signs. They gave you evidence so you would know who the Messiah is when he came. And you cannot deny that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth has fulfilled this in his life, death, and resurrection. He is the Messiah. This is what Paul did. And I think this is what we should do. Let's not abandon the Word of God. Let's not abandon the proofs God has given us. Let's be conversant with these proofs. And let's know how to use them uh, in presenting uh, Jesus Christ uh, to others. So this is what Paul did. Uh, verse 17. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the uh, Jews and with the devout persons in the market daily with them that met with him. You know, we got an idea today. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, dialogue. That's the big word today. The Catholic Church has been in dialogue with the Muslims for uh, about 30 years. And the Baptists are dialoguing with the Catholics. We're all dialoguing with one another. Come on. Uh, you don't dialogue about mathematics. I mean, I don't know about just two plus two is four. I mean, yeah, but how about, couldn't once in a while it be five? Uh, you, I, you, you laugh because it's absurd. You don't dialogue about truth. Truth does not change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That is so clear. You just can't change it. And you don't dialogue about it. You are deluding yourself and others. Tragically, the Church of England is involved in this sort of thing. The faith that once was so firm is up for grabs. It's up to the highest bidder. Well, they don't even care about it anymore. Truth doesn't really matter. Let's just get along with one another. Uh, after all, we're all taking different roads to get to the same place. You know, that, I'm, do they use that in England as well? Yeah. You know, that passes for being broad-minded. Uh, well, it sounds broad-minded. We're all taking different roads to get to the same place. That's not broad-minded. That is more narrow-minded and dogmatic than anything Jesus ever said. 
That's saying, oh, we'll let you take any road you want, but you got to go where we're going, and I'm not going where they're going. By God's grace, I'm going somewhere else. And Jesus was not so narrow-minded and dogmatic as to say there is only one destination. He said there's two. <laughs> And you take your pick, but you better pick the right one. And you better pick it on the, on the right basis. You know, I fly about 150,000 miles a year. Maybe Chuck flies more than that, I don't know. But I, would, I fly United Airlines almost always. I would love to get that mic. But if I did, the FBI is waiting for me when, when we land. But I can tell you what I would say, very simple. Uh, Oh my gracious, I'm in England, I don't know. What is, is a liberal here somebody that just believes anything, anything goes? Okay, some countries that's not true. Uh, well, I would say to my fellow passengers, how many liberals do we have aboard? Hands go up and I would say, well then I'm sure you all hope we have a liberal pilot flying this thing. A pilot who says, let's not be narrow-minded and dogmatic. I think one direction is as good as another. <laughs> why, why don't we just punch some buttons and see where it gets us? I mean, we're all taking different roads to get to the same place. Uh, you laugh because it is absurd. It is absurd. Uh, no, I guarantee you, no matter what foolish philosophical and religious ideas these people have, they all, unless they're psychotic and suicidal, they all hope in their hearts they've got a narrow-minded, dogmatic, fundamentalist pilot flying this thing. <laughs> A pilot who knows where he's going and follows the rules to get there. It's that way in every area of your life. You wouldn't want to go to a doctor and after he examines you, you say, Doc, what's the diagnosis and the prognosis? And he says, well, I wouldn't be so narrow-minded and dogmatic as to come up with a definite diagnosis. <laughs> I mean, what would you like? Open heart surgery has been very popular lately. Uh, I could transplant a kidney. I think, I think everyone is entitled to the operation of his choice. <laughs> It's absurd. You laugh. But when, in any area of life, but when it comes to that which is most important, is there a God? Does he have any ideas? You can't even play a game without rules. Even cricket. <laughs> you can't even play a game without rules. And yet, well, I, I have a little fun with people sometimes. Um, I walked into the doctor's office few months ago and I happened to sneeze and the nurse was standing there and said God bless you I said how does a sneeze qualify me for a blessing from God <laughs> and how is it that you are the one who has the authority to pass this on and what God are you talking about uh, well I, I'm serious don't say God bless you when people sneeze please that doesn't qualify anyone for a blessing and I had a little uh, heart procedure and I was in the hospital and the uh, nurse was putting an IV in me and uh, I, I love to talk about God, about Christ and so forth with these people. It's a great opportunity being in the hospital and uh, uh, so we get to talking about God and so forth and, and she says, well I can believe anything I want to believe. Let me out of here. Take that IV out of here. Give me my clothes back. I'm getting out of this place. What do you mean? Well, you can believe anything you want. You've got no medical procedures around here. Every nurse and every doctor just acts independently. Oh, no, no, no. We've got medical procedures. Oh, you have procedures and rules when it comes to taking care of the body. But when it comes to the soul and spirit and man's eternal destiny, then anything goes? That's not reasonable. And Paul said... Deliver, pray that God will deliver us from unreasonable and wicked men. And I, because all men have not faith. And I can tell you, if you don't have faith, you are unreasonable. And you will ultimately be wicked. Because that's the direction it goes. You're going to take your own way. You're going to go by your own rules. Well, Paul debated. He didn't dialogue. He debated with them. And I better move along. We don't have time. But everywhere he went, he disputed uh, in the synagogue. He reasoned with them. Chapter 18, verse 19. He came to Ephesus, and, and they left him there. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Reasoning. We've got to reason with people. 
the only reasonable thing a person can do is to believe in God, the creator of this universe, to believe in the word of God that tells us about him, the, our, our, the problem between man and God, and to submit themselves to him. This is reasonable. We need to reason with people. And we got too many uh, evangelists or whatever, and uh, they just want to get somebody into an emotional experience and an emotional commitment or decision, and it, do, it doesn't last. Verse 28, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, this is about Apollos. For he mightily convinced the Jews, publicly showing or proving by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Well, this is what we must do. From the scriptures, well, that brings us back to prophecy. And we mentioned yesterday two main topics of prophecy, Israel and the Messiah who comes to Israel. Remember, the Messiah is promised to Israel and through Israel to the world. There are no prophecies for Buddha, for Muhammad, for Confucius, for anyone. The prophecies are about the Jewish Messiah, the Messiah of Israel. And this book, the Bible, is unique. And the Messiah of Israel is unique. How are we going to recognize him when he comes? It is all laid out in scripture, prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. You can't possibly mistake who is the Messiah if you are willing to pay attention to the prophecies. So notice, he proved from the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's what we should do ourselves. Well, go to Romans, we're, we're almost there. So go to Romans chapter 1 and notice what it says. I'm not going to try to give you many proofs. I'll give you a few others. Chuck mentioned there are a lot of them he didn't touch on. I'll try to mention a, a some. But why and how do we do this? And wh what is the basis of this? Romans chapter 1, Paul, a, verse 1, a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. I mentioned yesterday being on this program, Spiritual Seeker. If God hasn't spoken, forget it. I'm not interested in human opinion. What does God say? And can we be sure of what he said? Nothing else is worthwhile. This is the gospel of God. I was reading a book by a rabbi titled The Myth Maker. And he claimed that Paul invented this gospel uh, and passed it off and it became Christianity. Paul says this is the gospel of God. Well, that's easy to say. How do you prove it? Well, he says, which he, that is God, promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. We've got what they said. It's all laid out. You can't deny it. This is the gospel of God if it's not the gospel of God. And if Jesus Christ did not fulfill what the prophet said, he is not the Messiah. I don't care how emotional you may feel about that. He is only the Messiah if he fulfilled the scriptures. You remember in um, Matthew 16, for example, when Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, okay, let's get out there, guys, and let's convince everybody. No, he said, don't tell anyone. Strange thing for him to say, wasn't it? Don't tell anyone? Why? Well, Chuck, I think it was alluded to, to the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, and now they are hailing him as the Messiah. And the, and the Pharisees say, rebuke your disciples. Jesus says, if they don't say it, the stones will cry out, because today is the day. What day was it? Well, Chuck told you. 69 weeks of years from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem. Daniel 9 gives the very day the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem. I think Brother Rosevere referred to Luke 12, 
where Jesus rebuked the rabbis. You guys can tell what the weather's going to be like. You can't tell the signs of the times. Why don't you know? Go back, read Nehemiah chapter 2. He gives you the very day that he received the authority from, from Artaxerxes Longimanus to rebuild Jerusalem. And Daniel 9 tells you from that day, that was the 20th year of Artaxerxes, who ruled from 445 B.C. to 4... Uh, to four, uh, I'm sorry, four, four, yeah, 465 B.C. to 425 B.C. The 20th year is 445 B.C. Nisan first, and from that date to the day the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on that donkey, 69 weeks of years. Don't you guys know? Just a few more days and you're there. Why don't you know the day of your visitation? Chuck referred to that. You're going to be destroyed because you didn't recognize the day of your visitation. It is all laid out so clearly. And I think this is what we have to do in presenting uh, the, the gospel. And one of the problems is the gospel involves a remedy for sin. And there's a lot of people are not willing. I don't, I don't want to make jokes here, but it reminds me, I think sometimes it helps. Uh, illustrates, it reminds me, maybe you heard of the, of the man that had both ears burned to a crisp? You know that story? And his friend said, how did that happen? And what he said, the phone rang, and I reached out to get the phone, but my wife had put the ironing board with a red hot iron right there, and I got that iron up to my ear, and that was a wrong number. <clears throat> and, and, and the guy said, what about the other ear? Well, he says, the stupid idiot, he called back again. <laughs> uh, not my fault, somebody else's fault. Uh, but it is our fault. We have sinned, and God has a remedy for that. And this is what the Messiah is about. Why the Messiah and the promise of the Messiah uh, begins in Genesis chapter 3. The seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. It was a serpent that deceived Eve. Sin entered into the world. God is a holy God. He had to cast them out of the garden. Man is separated from God, but the serpent isn't going to win. He'll bruise your heel, but the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head, will deliver him a death blow. And then you get it again in Genesis chapter 12, as, as God gives Moses, I'm sorry, gives Abraham this land, you know, it's, it's amazing what preachers sometimes say. I'm trying to talk fast. And uh, sometimes my wife says, now you didn't mean to say that, did you? But anyway, I, at least I caught that one. It wasn't Moses. It was Abraham. And he gives him the promise of the land. And then what does he say? In you and in your seed. Paul tells us in Galatians, the seed is Christ. In your seed will all the, the nations of the earth be blessed. How would they be blessed? Through Abraham's seed, because it is through Abraham, through the Jews, that the Messiah comes. And by the way, that's a simple explanation for anti-Semitism. Why are the Jews hated? Why have they been persecuted and killed down through history? Very simple, it's satanic. And I hope none of you is an anti-Semite here today. These are God's people. He calls himself, as I said, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 12 times, the God of Israel 203 times. These are his chosen people, and whatever you want to think about them, they, he has chosen them, and they belong to him, and that land belongs to them. But because the Messiah comes through Israel, if Satan could wipe out the Jews, no Messiah. You see that in Revelation chapter 12. The woman is about to give birth. This is, Revelation is mostly uh, foretelling the future, but this also gives you the past. And the red dragon is there. It's satanic. This is Satan. And he's going to devour the seed. If he can wipe out the Messiah, he's won his battle with God. And even after Satan was defeated by Christ on the cross, if Hitler could wipe them out, if the Muslims could wipe them out, he has won his battle with God. He has proved that God is a liar 
because the Bible is filled with promises that God would preserve these people in spite of the hatred, persecution, and the murder of the slaughter of them down through the centuries. God would preserve these people and in the last days he will bring them back into their own land as an identifiable ethnic group of people and one day the Messiah rescuing them in the midst of Armageddon will return and rule over them on the throne of his father David. There is no second coming. I'm not talking about the rapture. That's a separate event. There is no second coming unless Israel is in its land. And don't give me this nonsense about 10 lost tribes. We don't have time to go into that, but just simple logic would tell you if 10 tribes are lost, God can't fulfill his promise to bring them back in his land. Uh, what did Jesus say to his disciples? You will sit on two thrones, ruling the two th tribes of Israel. Is that what he said? <laughs> you will sit on 12 thrones, ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. And don't tell me there's 10 tribes somewhere hidden out there. Uh, and we don't even know who they are. They don't know who they are. Woo, amazing. And one day, voila, a sudden revelation. Oh, these guys over here, they're the lost 10 tribes. What about that? Hey, come on, tell me who they are. You got any candidates? That's nonsense. Uh, but I don't have time to go into that, but anyway. No second coming if the Jews are destroyed, if there's not 12 tribes back there. So what do we mean by the Messiah? He's the Savior. The Savior. Savior from what? Savior from the penalty for sin. God is a holy, righteous God, as we, as we just said. And God's wrath against sin, against sinful man, is revealed from heaven. Man has rejected him. He cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, and he kept the way to the tree of life with a flaming sword. You're not gonna to get to this tree unless you pass God's judgment. This is the sword of God's judgment. And one day, the second man, he's called, the last Adam, walked up to that sword. We all fled that sword. What's a big thing people complain about? The death penalty. The death penalty. Oh, that's so harsh. No, God pronounced the death penalty. Go and read it in the Old Testament. And if you want to know the ultimate example of the death penalty is the cross. When Christ stood in our place, he took our place. He was put to death by, by God himself. Don't think that it was that he was crucified, that that saves you. That's not going to save anybody. Ooh, heresy. Um, I want to make the sign of the cross, you know. Uh, the fact that Jesus was crucified would not save anyone. That would only add to our judgment. That's what we did to him. But the fact that when he hung on that cross, it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. Thou hast put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. It was the wrath of God that fell upon him that he took for us. And that is why there is redemption. There is salvation. And this is what the Messiah had to do. He had to come and pay the penalty. It's a matter of justice. I don't know, so many people don't understand this. You are dealing with God. Well, I don't think I've been so bad, you know. I, 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 I'm no worse than, than other people, and, and, and I, I've tried to live a good life, and I, I, I think God, you know, recognizes that I'm sincere. I, I think I'll make it, you know. Does God have anything to say about this? Have you paid any attention to God? Do you recognize that he is infinite in his justice? And for you think you could pay the penalty for your sins, it would take you eternity. It's an infinite penalty. And we are finite beings. Uh, I, I, I wish I had more time to talk about Islam. One of the delusions, major delusion of Islam, I recently had a discussion with a, uh, a leading Muslim in Southern California at California State University, Northridge. And we're each telling how you're going to get to heaven. How do you get to heaven as a Muslim? Well, of course, you die in jihad. That's the only sure way. And I don't have time to document that, but that was in the mind of these, uh, these hijackers as they hit the Twin Towers. Um, 
But uh, mo for most Muslims, most Muslims don't have the opportunity to die in jihad. Uh, so they think that in the last day, this is one of the five pillars of Islam that every Muslim must believe in, the last day. What's the last day? It's the day of judgment. It's the day when your good deeds are weighed in the balance against your bad deeds. And if your good deeds come out ahead uh, on the scale, then you make it to paradise. Come on! There is not a court of law on this earth that would go by that rule, is there? You get a ticket for speeding. Do they do that here in England? Uh, you get a ticket for speeding and you stand before the judge and you say, yeah, judge, I know I was speeding the other day, but I've driven more times within the speed limit than I have exceeding it. Now, wouldn't my good deeds outweigh my bad? I know I killed somebody a month ago, but I saved the lives of two people from drowning yesterday. Surely my good deeds will outweigh my bad. There is not a court of law in this world that would go by that rule. And you think, God will? But I know Catholics that think that. I know Anglicans who think that. Presbyterians and that. Oh yeah, my good deeds will outweigh my bad. You better forget it. It won't work in a court of law on this earth, and it will not work with God. And who are you to say that your good deeds will outweigh your bad? Who are you to say you haven't lived such a bad life? Jesus said you look on a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Sin is a matter of pride. Pride is the chief sin. Things that we don't even recognize are sinful in the eyes of a holy God. And you think you haven't been so bad after all? If you and I are honest with ourselves, we would have to acknowledge that each one of us is the chief of sinners. I know some of the things that I have done. I know some of the temptations that I've submitted to. I know some of the thoughts. That I don't know that about other people. I couldn't say that I'm as good as other people. And God's standards are perfect. And the Bible says, you break one commandment, you are guilty of all. Why is that? Because one commandment, to break one commandment, that's rebellion against God. That's the sin, that's the root of sin. Just one small sin is rebellion against God, taking your own way. So the penalty stands between God and man, and God loves us. He loves mankind. He doesn't want to uh, put his judgment upon us, but he can't just forgive sinners. How can God be just and forgive sinners? That would make him a party to our crime. The penalty must be paid. God can't just say, well, I just forgive you. His own law stands in his way. He can't change his law. He has pronounced, the soul that sinneth, it must die. And that is eternal separation from God. What is he going to do? He loves the world. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the, one of the unique things about, about Christianity, about the Bible, is God himself must come and pay this penalty. God himself, if you went to Isaiah 43, just as quickly as we can. I'm running out of time here. That's why I don't turn to the Bible. It takes so long. But anyway, Isaiah 43, verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me there is no Savior. Wow. Now, we're not going to take the time, but you can, you can look it up. Uh, well, you can look at verse 3. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Uh, you could go over to uh, ch chapter 45, verse 15. Verily thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Verse 21 have not I the Lord, uh, well, I'm sorry, who hath told it from, from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. And all through the Old Testament, God 
says that he is the only Savior. That's one of the problems with Jehovah's Witnesses. They deny that Jesus is God. If Jesus is not God, he can't be our Savior because the Bible very clearly says over and over, God says he's the only one that can save us. It's an infinite penalty. He alone is infinite. We're finite beings. And only the infinite God himself could pay the penalty for our sins. How is he going to do that? It's only possible because of the Trinity. Now go to chapter 48, verse 16. I wish we had time to talk about the Trinity. It's all through the Bible. We've had some teaching on that already at this conference. Verse 16, come ye near unto me. Hear ye this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I. Who is this one who's been there from the beginning? Go back as far as you can go. And he's there. He's God. But he's the God who speaks. He's the Word of God. But notice what it says. And now the Lord God and his Spirit hath sent me. What? God says, the Lord God and his Spirit sent me. Sometimes people say, wait a minute, if Jesus is God, uh, when he died on the cross, who was running the universe? Well, that's a whole other subject. Uh, we don't have time to get into it. Uh, but the Father didn't die. The Holy Spirit didn't die. Without the Trinity, there would be no Savior. God himself could not come as a man and pay the penalty for our sins. And you know the scriptures. You know Isaiah 7, 14. I saw us, um, a, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You know Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. That's the babe born in Bethlehem. Unto us a son is given. That's the eternal God, who, the Son, God the Son. The government will be upon his shoulders. He's the Messiah. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor. You don't have to go to some psychiatrist, let alone a Christian psychiatrist. One of Jesus' names is Counselor. Go to him for counsel. Counselor, the mighty God, the what? Everlasting Father. What? The babe born in Bethlehem was the father? Yeah, Jesus said, I and my father are one. You cannot explain it away. God himself is the only one who can be the savior. And God had to come as a man to pay the penalty for, for, for our sins. This is unique, absolutely unique uh, to the Bible, absolutely unique uh, uh, to Christianity. Well, what are, and we have the prophecies to prove it, what are some of the prophetic proofs? Well, Chuck, he overwhelmed you uh, with proofs, and that's not all. You have an interesting verse, Galatians 4.4. 4. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Uh, born of a virgin, born under the law, and so forth. What does it mean, the fullness of time, the precise time, the exact time? Well, the temple had to be there. I'll just give you four things that tell you the time. There was a narrow strip of time in which the Messiah had to be born. The temple had to be there because Malachi 3.1 says, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. And he did that when he came in and overthrew the tables of the money changers and so forth. So the temple had to be on the earth when the Messiah came. This is one reason why the Jews wanted to rebuild the temple. If we could have the temple, the temple's got to be there for the Messiah to come there. Yeah, but wait a minute. Just after the Messiah comes, he's going to be killed. And the temple and the city, Jerusalem, will be destroyed. Daniel chapter 9 tells us that. So he had to come when the temple was there. He had to come just before the temple would, and, and the city would be destroyed. That's a narrow window of time. Their genealogical records had to be there because he must be the son of David. You must be able to prove it. The genealogical records were destroyed in AD 70 when the temple in the city of Jerusalem were destroyed. No one can come along today and prove that he is of the seed of David. You got the right chromosomes, you can prove that you're a Levi, but not of the seed of David. And this is why the Bible begins in Matthew and in Luke. We have the genealogy of Jesus through his uh, the surrogate father, Joseph, in Matthew, and through his father-in-law, through Mary, uh, in, in Luke. Then Genesis 49.10 is another interesting prophecy. Way back then, 
Jacob gathers his sons together and he says, get around me now, I'm going to tell you what will befall you in the last days. That is your descendants. And when you get to verse 10, he says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his knees until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Shiloh is the Messiah. When did that happen? Well, they tell us about 7 AD. The, the Jews had uh, autonomy. They had uh, the, uh, the authority to practice their own religion under the Romans, although they were under the heel of Rome. And one of the things you had to be able to do to practice Judaism was execute people with stoning. And about AD 7, they lost that right. The scepter departed from Judah. Okay, we could give you others, but we don't have time. There, there was a book back there 40 years ago. I don't know whether some of you older folks remember it, uh, whether it even got to England. It was called The Passover Plot. Oh, an ingenious idea. Jesus knew the prophecies, and he and Judas conspired to fulfill them. Uh, yeah, when I was in the fifth grade, I can still remember there was a new history book that came out. It waxed a little bit too eloquent about Abe Lincoln because it said that Abe Lincoln was born in a log cabin he built with his own hands. Well, <laughs> how did Jesus get born in Bethlehem? He had to be born in Bethlehem. How did he conspire to fulfill that prophecy? Uh, and I could go on and on. I mean, he's going to get pierced with his si in his side. How did he know who would be the Roman guards on duty that day, the Roman soldiers, so that he could buy them off and get them to do exactly what they needed to do to fulfill the scriptures? Furthermore, you know the prophecies. You're going to get yourself killed and rise from the dead? Come on. Uh, Passover plot nonsense. Uh, but the scriptures were fulfilled. And Chuck has given us enough, and uh, well, I've about run out of time here, and I want to get to the resurrection. This is the gospel. What's the gospel? The gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes, right? Romans 1.16. But what is the gospel? If I said, go to, uh, wh where does it tell, where does Paul explain the gospel? Oh, well. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Paul says, this is the gospel I preached unto you, that you believe wherein you so forth and so on, whereby you were saved, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. Is that what it says? That is not what it says. That is not the gospel. I'm sorry. What is the gospel? How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And you must back up the gospel with the scriptures, that is with the prophecies, okay? This is how Paul preached the gospel. And we can prove the resurrection. Well, turn real fast, as fast as we can to 1 Corinthians chapter four. I don't know if some of my colleagues are gonna deny my disagree with my interpretation of this. 1 Corinthians 4, 9, For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. As I read that, you know, it's a point when a man wants to die, but everybody doesn't have to die. I hope that all of us will leave in the rapture. We will not all die, the scripture says but we will all, all be changed, okay? But Paul says, we apostles are the last ones who must die. Why must they die? They were unique witnesses. We got martyrs today. I mean, these guys that blow themselves up on a bus in Tel Aviv or whatever. Oh, they're martyrs. They do it out of loyalty to Islam, to Muhammad, and out of the hope that that will launch them into paradise. So how were the apostles different? Because they died as witnesses to facts. They said he did rise from the dead. He did heal the sick. He did open the eyes of the blind. He did walk on water. He did feed 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes and so forth. There is nothing you can do to me that will cause me to deny that. You can't kill me. And not one of them said, wait a minute, guys, please, please, don't kill me. I'll tell the truth. We stole his body. We hid it in Peter's basement. I mean, the whole thing's a myth. We made it up. Nobody is fool enough to die for what he knows is a lie. 
Paul said, we apostles are the last ones who must die. A great proof of, of the resurrection of, of, of Jesus Christ. Paul himself is the great proof. He hated the Jews. I'm sorry, he hated the Christians. He had them hailed into prison. He had them beaten. And he was there when they were killed and so forth. Suddenly he turns up a Christian. The Christians were afraid of him. They, they, they couldn't believe it. And Barnabas had to take him and introduce him and say, the guy's genuine. He's a real believer. <clears throat> and so people say, wow, look at that, that transformation. Uh, Saul of Tarsus, you became Paul the Apostle. Why would you leave? Turn to Galatians chapter 1 while I'm talking here. Why would you leave the security you had? You were a hero to the, to the Jews. You had a great future. And you threw it all away to become one of these despised Christians, these followers of the way that you were persecuting. You will be persecuted. You will be beaten. You will be imprisoned. You will be killed. Why would you do this? Paul says, I met him on the road to Damascus. He is alive. And that's as far as I've heard any apologists. I'm sure there are some that go farther, but I haven't heard, heard any. That is not enough, folks. That tells me Paul was sincere. He really thought he met Jesus, but it doesn't tell me he really did. He may have hallucinated. Uh, he may have had some guilt feeling and, and, and so forth. Uh, he, maybe he didn't really meet Jesus. How do we know he really met Jesus? Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. I certify you, brethren, the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Is that what it says? Well, Scripture is inspired of the Holy Spirit. That is not enough for Paul, in Paul's case. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he goes on, and he says, verse 17, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before me. I went into Arabia and so forth. And after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. And he rebuked Peter. Paul says, I didn't go to the running of the apostles and say, I think I met him on the road to Damascus. I, I, I'd kind of like to be a Christian too. I'd like to be an apostle. I'd like to go around preaching this gospel, but I could make some really bad blunders because I didn't study under Jesus with you fellows. Uh, you better give me a quick course in Christianity. Paul says, I didn't go to any of them. What I know, I learned from the resurrected Jesus Christ himself. He tells us, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, I received of the Lord what I delivered to you, how the Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, broke bread, and so forth. A person who wasn't even there at the Last Supper tells us exactly what happened at the Last Supper. And Paul who hated the Christians, who persecuted and killed them, not only does he become a Christian, he's the chief apostle. He writes most of the New Testament, and he rebukes Peter to his face. Peter, you are wrong. And I tell you that on the authority of the risen Christ, whom I have met and talked with him personally, and you cannot deny. That transformation didn't take place by an hallucination. He really sat at the feet of Jesus and he knew what he was saying and what he wrote was by the revelation of the resurrected Christ himself. Well, we have the fulfillment of all of this in Christ. And I'm going, I know I'm over time here, but I think they can squeeze it in somehow or other. Let me just say a few last words without which all that I've said I think would, wouldn't be enough. What are we going to do about this? What must I do to be saved? Well, you got to get baptized and catechized, and you got to join the church, and, and you got to work real hard at it, and turn over a new leaf, and live a good enough life. Is that what it says? Believe. The Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Think about it logically for a minute. What else can you do? If Christ paid for the, your sins, an infinite penalty, he paid a price you couldn't pay. Can you add to this? What can you do? All you can do is believe that this is who he is. This is what he did. 
The Bible says very clearly, this is the gift of God. What's a gift? Well, this dear man here has been watching so intently. I want, I just, you know, my wife and I in our basement, we discovered a long lost Rembrandt worth hundreds of millions of dollars a few weeks ago. I just want to give it to you. And, and he says, uh, Dave, I'll give you, what's your smallest thing here, a penny? No. Yeah, Dave, I'll give you a penny for it. He's done two things. He has insulted me, number one, right? Offer me a penny for a priceless painting? Listen carefully. This is the word of God, not my word, and logic will tell you this is true. You offer God anything. You offer him your good deeds, your gifts to charity, your prayers, your church membership. You offer God anything in exchange for the infinite gift that Christ bought at an infinite price. You are insulting God. Do you understand that? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, only possible because of who he is and what he did for us. Second thing he's done, offers me a penny for a priceless gift. He has refused the gift, hasn't he? Isn't that a rejection of the gift? A gift has to be free. You offer God anything again. You are rejecting the gift that Christ purchased for you and God wants to give it to you as a free gift. Nothing else you can do but believe in him and receive him as your savior. Maybe some of you have never understood that, although you're at a conference like this. This is the word of God, and this is logic, and this is justice. You don't appease God. You don't negotiate with God. He sets the rules, and the rules are set by his perfect, infinite justice. The penalty had to be paid, and only Christ could pay it. You know, remember in the garden, Jesus wept. He sweat, as it were, drops of blood falling down on the ground. What, what, what was he saying? Father, he was not worried about the nails driven in his hands and feet. He was going to be made sin for us. He was going to take the, the waves and the billows of God's wrath, his anger against sin, were going to be poured out upon him. And his holy soul shrank from this. And he said, Father, isn't there some other way that mankind could be saved? If there is, don't make me go through with this. And what did the father say? There's no other way. The penalty has to be paid because Yahweh laid on him the iniquity of us all. He put the judgment for our sins upon him. So when Christ gave his spirit into his father's hands, what did he say? He didn't uh, expire in weakness. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down to myself. He cried out in triumph to telestai. It is finished is the translation of our Bible, but to telestai is a Greek word that was stamped upon promissory notes, documents in that day. It meant paid in full. Jesus Christ paid in full the penalty for our sins. And if he didn't, there is no hope for mankind. And if he did, don't you dare try to buy it off, buy him off with something else. Don't you dare deny that he's paid the full penalty. Don't you dare try to do anything except receive from him this gift that he wants to give to you. Father, thank you for your word. Oh God, it is so powerful, it is so tremendous and we can't even begin in a short time to present it. But Father, we know without the shadow of a doubt that you are God, that this is your word, and Jesus Christ is one with the Father. He is God from eternity past who became a man to die for our sins. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much that you would do this. And Lord, I pray that there is no one here today who would leave this conference without opening their hearts to you and accepting that free gift by faith on the basis of the evidence. And they will be transformed from death to life. And Lord, help us to go in the power of your spirit and with your word and to present the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God from the Holy Scriptures and prove that Jesus 
is who your word says. And Father, help us to open the eyes and help us to deliver many before it is too late. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. There's elements of the Bible that are so amazing. They cannot be there by coincidence, only by design. There is that witness of the Bible of its historical accuracy. One of the things that I love, in fact, Dave Hunt made reference to this, with each new discovery in the archaeological world, what we find is more evidence for the reliability of the Bible, not less. Thanks to the Victorian, the British Victorian uh, explorers in the Middle East, we have a lot of information available to us today which prior to that period they thought cities like the city of Babylon and Nineveh, that they were sort of like the city of Atlantis. They were just uh, uh, fictitious places. But of course during the Victorian era, British explorers went throughout the Middle East and they began to discover these places that in using the Bible as their compass they began to find the cities of Babylon and the cities of Nineveh and so on and so forth. Of course as which has already been pointed out the Bible ventures into the area of prophecy which no other ancient document, in fact no religious document at all, ventures as deep and as wide into prophecy as the Bible does. Places its whole credibility on its ability to speak of tomorrow, yesterday. Prophecies in the Bible, they are astonishing. But the one that I love as the greatest proof for the claims of Christianity was given by Jesus Christ as once again the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus as recorded in Matthew chapter 12 and they say we want to see a sign from you and Jesus answered and said to them an even adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth when Jesus Christ was finally approached by his greatest protagonist. And they say, show us a sign. We keep asking you, show us a sign. He says, there'll be no other sign given to you than his own resurrection. Yes, when we look at the philosophical arguments for the existence of God, they, they provide a very solid foundation. Yes, when we look at the credibility of the manuscript authority of the Bible, we see incredible information on the side of the Bible. Yes, when we look at the reliability, both its structure, its historical accuracy, and its prophetic accuracy, yes, those are all solid areas of truth. But when Jesus Christ decided to put his finger on the area that would be the final proof to all mankind, it was his own resurrection. When Dr. Luke, the disciple of Paul, was writing the book of Acts, he begins in chapter 1 by saying, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom. Luke makes a very powerful and even ostentatious statement by saying the facts for the resurrection of Jesus Christ are so great they are infallible. They're infallible. When you look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you cannot leave him in the grave. Though historians have attempted many times you're faced with a real problem. What happened to the body of Jesus Christ? 
There are those who say, well, the disciples in the emotion of the moment, especially these women, you know the story. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea very hurriedly prepared the body and placed it in the tomb and they went away. On the 17th of Nisan, 32 AD, Sunday morning, the women came very early in the morning to the tomb and, you know, some of you men, you understand this when you get that panic call from your wife and she says she's lost the car. <laughs> they just went to the wrong tomb. And there are those who think, well, they just forgot where the body was. You know, they were, they were burdened with grief and it was early in the morning and it's not a new thing to have people forget so the, the women just forgot where the body was. And, and so if we went to Jerusalem today and we dug in the right crypt, we would be able to unearth the bones of Jesus Christ. But there's a significant problem with that proposal, and it's simply this. Not only would the women have to have had forgotten, but Joseph of Arimathea, in whose tomb he laid. The guards who guarded the tomb, they would have had to have forgotten it. In fact, everyone in Jerusalem would have had to have forgotten it. Yet there are those who even today say, oh, what happened to the body of Christ was his disciples were just burdened with grief and they forgot. There are those who say, well, actually, what happened was Jesus faked his death. It's called the swoon theory. The idea that Jesus was a clever man and he sort of put himself in a deep trance when he was there on the cross and he fooled the Roman guards into believing he was dead. And so when everything quieted down in the cool of the night, he sort of collected himself, rolled the stone away and ran off. And there's those people that they've written books on this idea of the swoon theory, but just stop for a minute and use common sense and ask yourself this. The gospel accounts validated by Roman practice tell us that when slaves are crucified, rich men were never crucified, only slaves. When slaves are crucified, first of all, they are scourged by the Romans. Many never made it to crucifixion because they would be so brutalized. The gospel accounts, of course, tell us that Jesus was so brutalized that by the time it came time for him to carry his cross to Calvary, he couldn't. And so they had to compel one Simon the Cyrene to come and carry his cross for him. And, and so he walked alongside. Having had the nails pierce his hands and his feet, spending three hours on the cross, he expires. And the Romans, who were experts at killing by crucifixion. They came and they were astonished that he had expired so quickly. So they pierced his side. The Gospels recording that out from his side flowed blood and water. Now I got to tell you, I have a hard enough time getting up in the morning after working in the garden for three hours. How are you going to survive Roman scourging, crucifixion, pierce in the side? You're going to rise in the tomb at night, roll the stone away, defeat four heavily armed Roman soldiers, and escape. Surely the swoon theory has no credibility. You have those who say, well, what happened was the disciples stole the body. Of course, that was the very first idea that the chief priest put forward as the Roman guards came and told them what had happened. He said, well, the, we'll put together this story that the disciples came and stole the body away, but don't worry, we'll give you some money and we won't execute you. That would be the story of the century because these guys had two swords between them and Peter proved that he couldn't hit anybody's head. He wasn't much good with a sword. And they're going to go take on heavily guarded troops? I don't think so. Why would they fight for a corpse when they wouldn't even stand with him when he was arrested? 
You even have those that say, well, the idea of the resurrection was a fabrication of the disciples. You know, after all, they had spent three years of their life investing, following this guy, and you know, after the crucifixion, they probably had a little committee meeting and said, well, look, guys, uh, you know, I've spent all my, I've sold my house and spent all my retirement money on this, and uh, uh, I hate to see this thing just come to nothing. Uh, can't we do something? Can we do something with this thing? And they said, well, let's, let's concoct a story that uh, he's raised from the dead. You know, we'll all sell books and go on speaking tours, and, and uh, it'll be great. Of course, you know the church history concerning all of these guys. They all suffered great persecution. Ten of the eleven remaining disciples of Jesus were executed for their witness to the resurrected Christ. John being the only one who wasn't killed because God, was, because God wasn't done with him yet. He had to write his three epistles in the book of Revelation. The question you have to ask yourself is, why didn't at least one of them say that they had lied? Why go to the grave for a lie? You see, when you look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I think you have the greatest fact that has ever existed for the claims of Christianity, the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. As you examine that, you can either believe that the disciples forgot where the body was, or Jesus faked his death, or the disciples stole the body, or the disciples made it up, or it's a fantastic fact. You see, that's why when Jesus was speaking to these doubters, he said, there'll be no other sign given to you. You want some more proof? That's the greatest proof you, you'll ever need the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. You can't just dismiss it as an unimportant historical event. It's either true and Christianity is true or it's false and Christianity is false. Paul made that very clear before the Corinthian church that if Christ is not risen, then there is no resurrection. You're still in your sins and we are above all men most miserable. Because there is no hope. It astonishes me within this nation. A recent poll that I read last year says that within the largest Protestant denomination within this country, one third of its ministers do not believe in the resurrection. Well, then they need to read 1 Corinthians where Paul says, if you don't believe in the resurrection, then Christ isn't risen. And if Christ isn't risen, you're still in your sins. So you better just party, man. Because this is all there is in the world. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest fact. Now, as we see throughout the Bible, we see a number of instances where people, after being given facts, are called now to respond upon those facts. In John chapter 12, verses 35 to 40, Jesus says, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of a light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which is spoken, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. What an astonishing statement to recognize that one of the important doctrines that we need to understand concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ is simply this, that God reveals himself to those who are seekers. If you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. But if in that 
searching, you begin to harden your heart so that you will not believe. The Bible tells us that he will ultimately harden your heart so you cannot believe. Therefore, he tells these would-be seekers, walk while you have the light. Rightly assess the facts and the data that is before you now. Many of us in this conference will make reference, of course, to Romans chapter 1. But herein, starting in verse 18, we read Paul's warning, really, where he writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Sadly, that can be the end of an individual who closes his eyes to the light that surrounds him. If you refuse to acknowledge the evidence that God provides, he will ultimately remove your ability to even see it. John, as he was finishing his gospel, though he tells us in chapter 20 that he could have written many things, verse 30 says, truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have eternal life in his name. If you truly say that you are a seeker, then be fair-minded with the evidence. Prejudice has a way of blinding and binding its owners. It blinds them. They do not see, not because they can't see, but they will not see. John says, look, I've written all you need to know. There's much more he could have said. Indeed, I suppose if he would have recorded all the signs and wonders, it would have filled all the libraries in the world, we're told. But he's given us just enough. He's given us just enough within his gospel for us to know that God incarnate dwelt in human flesh, came as a man to not only show us the true characteristics of God, but to become our salvation, to take upon himself the righteous judgment of God upon, uh, that it needs to be upon us. Yet his payment of sin is complete and total. Yes, I believe in giving real seekers facts. Nobody's asked to take a blind leap of faith in the, into the intellectual abyss. But I think if you deal fairly with the facts that are available to you, you, like so many who have gone before you, will fall on your knees and be amazed that one so great, so powerful, would be so loving to love the likes of me and you. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful. We're grateful for your word. We're thankful for the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the evidence that it is to our heart of the truth, truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for all the people here in this auditorium this day. Lord, those who are going through a faith crisis, I pray, Lord, that you would further reveal yourself to them. Satisfy their search. Lord, those who are just 
playing fast and loose. Lord, I pray that you'd convict their heart even now. Lord, may they be aware that without you, they face eternal damnation. But covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, they're offered sonship, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask all of these things. Amen. Thank you very much. They're killing them by the thousands. Uh, go to Nigeria. Fifteen of the northern states in Nigeria have adopted Sharia. By the way, you've got a big problem in, 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 in Britain, and I don't have time to talk about that, but you probably know more than I do. Uh, what is happening here? They want Sharia. They want to adopt this, and if you do not accept it, off with your head. That's what Muhammad said. This is from the beginning. Don't give me this nonsense. It's a peaceful religion. Tell me where would, did it ever bring peace? Well, I don't have time to, to, to get into that. Uh, but when you threaten someone with death, how can you be sure that they really believe what they say they believe? Because they're just saying it in order not to be killed. So let's have an international debate. Let's lay out the facts. Let's have an even playing field and then let people decide on the basis of the evidence and stop this threat, these threats with death, of death, okay? I think that makes sense. Um, well, we can give you the evidence, but it's not a debate. Uh, and uh, I was asked to give some evidence, and I better get down to it here as quickly. I don't have much time left. <clears throat> now, we're talking about proof that the Bible is God's word. First of all, we have prophecy. This is the great proof. I've just been quoting some scriptures, but turn to uh, Isaiah 46 uh, and, and verse 9, for example. You know these scriptures well. Most of you would, I presume. And notice what God says. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Well, prove it declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel will stand and I will do all my pleasure. Go over to chapter 48, verse 5. I have even from the beginning declared it to thee before it came to pass, I showed it to thee, lest thou shouldst say mine idol hath done them and my graven image and my molten image hath commanded them. Go back to Isaiah 42. God says, I'm not going to let you give credit to your idols. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens. And I will watch over history to make certain that it does. And when my word is fulfilled, you will have to acknowledge I am God. And the Bible is my word. And there are no prophecies in the Quran. There's no prophecies in the Hindu Vedas, Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana, Mahabharata. You go on and name them. Sayings of Buddha and Confucius and so forth. I can tell you prophecy, prof whoops, prophecy is unique to this book, the Bible. We're not talking about cheap psychic predictions. We're talking about world-shaking, history-making events foretold centuries, even thousands of years before they happen, and the whole world has observed their fulfillment. You cannot be an atheist. You cannot be an agnostic. You cannot deny God has done exactly what he said. There are two major topics of prophecy. Uh, in the Bible, and I think you know who they are. The Bible is about 28% prophecy, by the way. Uh, well, Israel is number one, and the Messiah is number two. Christ, the word Christ, is found 555 times in the Bible. Well, that's a lot. It's a big topic. How many times do you think the word Israel is found? I'm talking about the King James Bible now. Being in England, I couldn't talk about anything else, could I? Uh, St. James, or St. King, oh, King James, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, in the King James Bible, Israel, the word Israel is found 2,565 times. Wow, this is a major topic. Somebody says, why do you believe in God? The Jew? It's very simple. You can't deny it. <coughs> Pardon me. The entire history of Israel, the Jews, has been laid out in the Bible. God gave him a land. First thing you learn about him in, in Genesis chapter 12. He brought Abraham to a land. He said, I'm going to give this land to you and to your seed forever and so forth. Uh, and uh, he tells that they will be scattered. He's going to cast them out because of their sin. Uh, he's going to judge them. 
Anti-Semitism is foretold in the Bible in detail. Anti-Semitism is just exploding in France right now. There was a Holocaust after the Holocaust. I don't know how many of you are aware of that. The skeletal survivors of Auschwitz that were released from that extermination camp when they went back to reclaim their homes in Poland from which the Gestapo had taken them to exterminate them. The Polish people in possession of those homes would not let them have them and kill them. Over 200 in the, in the city of Kelso, Poland. There was a holocaust across Europe. And I'm sorry, I could go into details about what Britain did. The British Navy, uh, uh, Holocaust survivors in rickety ships within sight of the, pro of the promised land, driven back by the British Navy and put into, uh, into their uh, camps during the war. Maybe you're not aware of it. 1944, Hitler, Himmler offered 500,000 Hungarian Jews to the Allies for two dollars apiece. For one million dollars they could have saved 500,000 from Hitler's ovens. Britain said there's no room in Palestine for them. America wouldn't take them. No one would take them. It's not just Hitler who was guilty of the Holocaust. And they were sent back, to, sent to the ovens. Do I dare to say with my British audience, and you could say plenty of things about America, but you can count. You, know, you had the Balfour Declaration, 1917. You had the Declaration of Principles uh, of, of the League of Nations in 1922, recognizing that land they call Palestine belonged to the Jews. The whole world recognized it. The victors in, in World, War, World War I divided that up. They created Saudi Arabia. They created Iraq and Iran and, and, and Jordan, Transjordan and so forth. And they were supposed to create a homeland for the Jewish people. Palestine belonged to them. I'm sorry, go back and read your history. Britain betrayed them. They betrayed the Jews. They let in the Arabs for oil. They, they kept the Jews out. And finally, the, the partitioning of Palestine by the United Nations, November 29th, 1947, they gave them 18% of the land they were supposed to have. And you can count the demise of the British Empire from the time they turned against the Jews. God said, I will curse those who curse you and the empire upon which the sun never sank began to shrink uh, it's just a simple fact of history god said you will be hated and persecuted and killed like no other people but i'm not going to let them let them destroy you i will preserve you an identifiable ethnic group of people i will bring you back into your own land in the last days i'm going to create a nation in a day <laughs> And then I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. You know uh, the scriptures. Um, uh, Zechariah chapter 12, God says, Behold, in the last days I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. It will become a burdensome stone around the necks of all the nations of this world. What is the number one in America? Anti-Semitism is incredible. I could document it for you uh, a whole lot more than this. Well, I don't think any honest person uh, can be an atheist. You can't deny it. There are so many proofs that the Bible is God's word, that God exists. The Bible was written over a period of 1,600 years by 40 different authors. Most of them never knew one another. They came from different times in history. They came from different cultures. Why is it the cohesiveness of this book? The only thing they claimed to have in common was they were all inspired by the one true God. And this book is so interwoven. Themes, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about a theme in my next session when we talk about the Messiah. It runs from Genesis to Revelation. And it is always in agreement. And yet there are new revelations that build. How do these guys that never knew one another, how do they come up? with this inspiration that is so in harmony, perfect harmony, with everything that has been written before or would be written after them. You couldn't sit down with a computer and come up with a new book in the Bible and do that. You're going to make a mistake. You've got to say something significant. You can't contradict what's gone before. You've got to be in, in harmony with and in fulfillment. It's an amazing book. Comes to the Koran. We've got to take the word of one guy, Muhammad in a trance and dictating and this stuff is coming out and so forth. Pretty tough reading, trying to read it. But, but anyway, the Bible is tough reading in some places as well. But for the Bible, 
every author who claimed to be inspired by God, we've got 39 other witnesses. All of us in perfect harmony. It's amazing. And there is a continuity. The new revelations that, are, that God gives agree with the bank, uh, uh, with what has gone before. Try to compare it with the Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon. It's one of those things that came out of the United States. I'm sorry about that, folks. I apologize for it. But they can't even find the topography. They haven't found a pin. They can't even find a bay or a mountain. Can't find a city. They can't find ruins. They can't find a coin. They can't find anything. And the Mormons, they got a lot of money. They've been searching South, Central, North America for decades. They can't come up with a pin. What about the Bible? I mean, just go to your British Museum. You've got museums have mountains of evidence around, around the world. I remember when I was growing up back in the 30s, the skeptics said the Hittites didn't even exist. Well, what do you know? Every time they say that about the Bible, the archaeologists dig a little bit deeper and they come up with the evidence. And you can go visit the, uh, we, our family visited years ago, the uh, Hittite Museum in Ankara, Turkey. You got a whole museum filled with, with, with relics. Not the least of the proofs that the Bible is God's word is what the Bible says about itself. You take, the Bible claims to be the word of God. The Bible claims that there is a particular power in words spoken by God. You know how Genesis, the th third verse in the Bible, God said, let there be light and there was light. You know, Hebrews 11:3. by faith we understand the wor worlds were framed by what? The word of God. So that things that are seen are not made out of things that did appear. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the what? Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by the Word, were made by Him. And without Him, without the Word, was not anything made that was made. What's the significance of that? I remember... Uh, a particular verse that gave me r real problems. I pondered it for years, and, and that is Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Well, I could kind of handle that. And the joints and marrow. What? Joints and marrow? What are you talking about? Joints and marrow? How does the Word of God divide the center of the joints and marrow? And what do you know? Then we discover DNA. <laughs> joints and marrow, I guess, is about as close together as you could get. <laughs> and it is distinguished by the DNA. We all begin uh, as a single cell. Is that right? We'll let these scientific people verify that for you uh, in their sessions. We all begin as a single cell. Uh, it's about the size of a dot, a period at the end of a sentence. How does that little cell know how to build a body? That's all it begins with. You're going to build trillions of other cells of many different kinds. You know, Linus Pauling, Nobel Prize winner, said a single cell is more complex than New York City. You go back and study it, it's just incredible at the microscopic level. and. Darwin didn't know anything about this. I mean, the microscopic level disproves evolution. You can't even begin. Nobody has written a book. Nobody's done a thesis. They don't even talk about the microscopic evolution, the origins back there, because you can't, you can't possibly handle it. How does it know, this little dot, how to build this body? DNA. It's written on every cell how to manufacture and operate the incredible relationships. And I'm sure some of the other speakers will give you some of this. It is beyond our comprehension. Uh, uh, Roger talked a little bit about the human eye. You know, they discovered uh, a star shell way down in the depths of the ocean has about a thousand eyes. And each one of them, I'm talking about the top scientists now, the guys that deal with lenses and so forth. They said every eye of that star shell is 
10 times better and more complex than anything we scientists have been able to come up with. And a thousand of them developed independently of one another, just evolved, come on. Uh, that's a little bit hard, hard to swallow. DNA, what is DNA? I used to talk about probabilities. I could give you probability after probability. Impossibility mathematically. Evolution is impossible. One of your own, uh, uh, his name escapes me at the moment, um, uh, but anyway, uh, one of the top astronomers and mathematicians uh, in, in the world, he said, go to your computer, just put, you got to have so many of these things lined up in the right order. To get it by chance, it is off, whoops, it is off the chart. Uh, there is no way you could possibly do it. It is mathematically impossible. Uh, Sir Fred Hoyle said this, and he said they all know it. <clears throat> well, why do they keep teaching it? Well, he said because it's academically respected. Uh, and if you don't, you lose your tenure and so forth. Okay, but we don't talk, I don't have to talk about that anymore. We're into information. Information, what is information? It's written in words, it's in a language, it is encoded. It takes certain protein molecules to decode this. Information, look, this is information on a page. It's there in ink, it's on paper. Did the ink and the paper originate the information? Of course not, that's absurd. Information can only come from an intelligent source, and Einstein himself said, he's, he's not a, a Christian by any means, he said matter cannot produce information, it cannot form itself into information. And we have information written in words, a language, on the DNA, and that tells the DNA, the cells, what to do. Look, we now know that physical life is not possible without words. It's that simple. There is no physical life without words. And you know what the Bible says? It says there is no spiritual life. That's that non-physical being that lives inside. It cannot have life. We're dead, we're separated from God by sin, and you cannot have life without words. The Word of God, which lives and abides forever, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, you are born again by the Word of God, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And I would just suggest, go back and study the word, word. Jesus comes in in the final judgment to this earth. And who, what's his name? The word of God. A sword proceeds out of his mouth. This is the word of God. And we will all be judged by the word of God. I'm sorry I've done a poor job. <laughs> I don't have much time. I, I, it takes me about an hour to get warmed up. Uh, but but uh, I think I've given you something to think about and to pass on to your friends. We got to praise God. Let's count our blessings. I'll teach you a lesson. And yeah, we're going to praise God. Yeah, yeah. Uh. We got to praise God. Let's count our blessings. I'll teach you a lesson. And yeah, we're going to praise God. Yeah.